everyone's in from the writing room now, so I suggest you get started. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Kyle King. I'm the Managing Director of Capacity Building International, and we're here today on this webinar series. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can uh, have a look. So basically today we're on this webinar series that we're talking about COVID-19 resilience planning and emergency management. Now this is actually a unique series today uh, because of the fact that it's blending two different webinar series together into a single event, which is uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic because we're actually sharing audiences. So I'm going to be the facilitator today for the meeting and for the panelists. And uh, again, the, the two series that are being blended are basically the uh, the webinar series for 2021 that's done with the International Emergency Management Society and Capacity Building International, and then also the University of Manchester and their series as well. So we're going to be covering a bunch of different topics today, but just a little bit about myself. So uh, I've had about uh, 21 years international experience working from the various international organizations, and my background is in the emergency response side of the house with a, a, with a background in the fire and emergency services, and of course, I've spent about um, a number of years with the different organizations from NATO to OSCE and everything else like that. And I was a chief fire officer, instructor, and inspector through a number of different countries. And so I'm just going to be facilitating today and taking your questions, but I do want to get through a few quick points before we actually get started in administrative remarks. Now, um, what that means is, of course, as the, the normal things as we've all been through Zoom and everything else is that we all are aware of the fact that, of course, there's a chat function. And if you uh, want to have any questions or if you do want to use the chat, uh, make sure you have the opportunity uh, to use that chat function. At the bottom of the screen, it's in the center. If you, you've probably seen that before, some people are already chatting. Uh, and just type your question during the event when the panelists are actually uh, presenting. I'll try and capture all those questions as we move through the webinar itself today. And we will try and uh, just capture all those depending on the amount of questions that we have and get to a Q&A session towards the end of the event today and get to all the questions that you're asking. Now, uh, ask those directly, use the, the chat function and I'll capture those there. Everybody is muted upon arrival. If there is a time to do so, we will allow people to open their mics. And of course, we would ask that you turn on the camera if you're comfortable doing so and asking a question uh, to the panelists themselves. So having said that, there are view options, as you can see, uh, because this is in the meeting format and there's a, there's a lot of cameras and things like that. There is the speaker view and the gallery view. You can change those options as well if you want to change the layout and the format of the Zoom call in case you want to have, of course, the screen wider for the presentation and everything else. And so with that, I just want to introduce the panel that you're going to have today. David Powell is a principal advisor in uh, Recovery, Renewal, Resiliency, Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute. We also have Duncan Shaw, the professor of operational research and Critical Systems, Alliance Manchester Business School, and Harold Drager, the president of the International Emergency Managers Society here with us today on the panel discussing these topics. And I look very much forward to that presentation. So at this point, I will turn it over to David. Over to you. Kyle, thank you. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Uh, can you just confirm, Kyle, you can see the first slide? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Kyle. So uh, my name is David Powell. As, as Carl's introduced, I'm a principal advisor. My background is actually in the UK and in, uh, sorry, UK military and UK policing, and then seven years in local government as an emergency manager. So I, I kind of have a history and a uh, a personal interest in the profession of emergency management. Duncan and I have known each other for probably about 10 years on various research projects. And I'm delighted that he invited me to work with him and the team on this particular pro product, looking at response, recovery, renewal and resilience. Uh, I'm gonna share with you some uh, slides that give you a quick overview on both what we've been doing at Manchester but also actually some of the issues that have become very different around COVID. So what makes COVID so different from other disasters that we've all experienced in our lifetime, certainly previously? What are the kind of opportunities that the disaster presents? And then lastly, what the implications are for the emergency management profession, which I hope both Duncan and then Harold will pick up and run with as well. So I, for me, I'd be delighted to hear 
your views. I'm certainly very interested in the chat function, uh, you know, and I'd, I'd like to hear from you what you think some of the key issues are facing the profession on the back of the COVID experience. So who are we at Manchester? We're a team of academics uh, and people like myself who've been working now for 14 months. We've been developing a recovery framework, uh, which will become an international standard, 22393, for recovery based on the COVID experiences, but applicable to all disasters into the future. We've been running an, a, a, a series of workshops and webinars because we're very interested in other people's views and their experiences. We've probably done about 44 plus, and we'll do at least uh, an equal amount, I think, before the project has, has finished. Um, we have expert insights from both governments internationally here in the UK and beyond, from the United Nations, WHO, uh, World Bank, Resilient Cities Network, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we've conducted probably about 70 plus interviews now with Chief Resilience Officers, Emergency Managers and other officials uh, and indeed local politicians who've been involved in the uh, COVID experience. We're working with a range of partners over the way, a lot of here in the UK. For, so for those of you in a UK audience, Greater Manchester, uh, Thames Valley, Avon, Somerset, Essex, uh, to name a few, not all. We're also working with cities of Vancouver, Canada, Miami in the USA, uh, Argentina, Chile, and uh, Ramallah out in Palestine, which has given us a fantastic and fascinating range of experiences uh, across the globe with regards to uh, COVID. One of our key products is the fortnightly Manchester briefing, uh, which is a collection of global lessons that we bring together into one document. Uh, I think we're on about the 35th, 36th issue now. It contains a, a balance between case studies and also lessons that we've collected from around the world, which people are, we, we're pleased to hear have found particularly interesting. So please have a look at it. The link is in the chat function below. It's a, it's a great document. And of course, feel free to add to it uh, from your own experiences. So let, let me just talk very briefly about why COVID has been so different from other crises. And it's all around the impacts of it being so incredibly different. So if we look at the scale, we've been thinking about the recurring overlaps between response and recovery, and indeed other concurrent events. So, you know, we first went into recovery in summer of 2020, but then very quickly shifted back into response mode again as the second wave began to hit here in the UK. And it's been similar around the globe. And of course, some are now facing a, a fairly severe uh, third wave. So it's been very unusual to flip flop between response and recovery on such a, a regular basis. And of course, it's really upending the universal truth that recovery would always last longer than response. What we're actually finding is that the response is the really prolonged part of this disaster. Recovery is proving to be, in some places, really quite short lived. It's had an addictive pace from it, uh, from the beginning. You know, some, some people have been working since March of last year, had very little uh, let up, and the, the scale, the pressures, uh, and the external kind of impact of issues like Brexit and Black Lives Matter, for example, have continued keeping that pace at a speed. So, you know, there's some real welfare issues for emergency managers and colleagues who've been at the front of this for a prolonged period of now in a way that nobody's experienced in a long, long time. Here in the UK, and uh, uh, but not unique to the UK, it's been very different because this has been very much about national direction of local delivery. So, you know, most normal events are, are geographically contained, you know, lo led by the local kind of response and supported by national government. This one's been turned completely on its head, and in particular because it's had such all-reaching impacts and is a health-led crisis in the first place. You know, national governments have been right at the forefront of uh, leading what we've been doing. We've seen some disconnects in the last 14 months between things like guidelines and assumptions and the reality. You know, were we really prepared for this event? Um, I, I, you know, I think the, the events that have transpired in the last 14 months shown that we had a limit to our imagination about exactly what would happen in a pandemic beyond the initial uh, response phase. Certainly some of the geopolitics of COVID that have seen some variations across the globe and how it's been responded to and the degree and level of cooperation. Very interested in your views about how the emergency management profession has, has managed to cooperate across the globe and some issues around systemic sharing of things like data, practices and policies. 
we've certainly had some fragilities exposed uh, by the COVID experience, but you know, one of the, the positives to flip it on its head is that concept of vulnerability, I think, has been brought to everybody's doorstep. And again, in a way that no other disaster has done before. You know, some disasters we watch and play on the television, they're happening somewhere else. They're not affecting us directly. Well, COVID has absolutely affected everybody, some more than others, of course. But that concept of being vulnerable to a, a disaster has suddenly hit home, I think, for, uh, you know, a global audience in a way that it's never done before. Sadly, it's also exposed some inequalities and fragilities in our systems, either directly as a result of the pandemic, the health crisis itself, or indeed indirectly as a result of the way that we've managed some of the consequences and the response and recovery to um, uh, COVID. And I think one of the key messages here is that there's a moral onus on us all to ensure that these lessons don't just last kind of at the moment of suffering you know, that we need to look at how prolonged some of these inequalities and fragilities will continue to be. We've also seen a failure of imagination at kind of political organisation on individual level. It's not a criticism. It's a realism of how do you possibly think about just how bad and just how prolonged and just how impactful this would be on health, economy, society, you know, all aspects of how we live our life. And then also some changes uh, as a result of it. So this has required a multiple relationship across resilience. So normally it's the resilient responders, you know, police, the emergency services, fire, ambulance, health partners, maybe local government. This one has required a much broader uh, set of relationships to be able to make sure that we remain resilient. The business community, society itself, you know, the, pro the, the production of vaccination, this is, has reached out and created the need for relationships that we don't experience in other disasters such as flooding or indeed even uh, some of the severe, the other severe weather uh, events. And the kind of roadmap detours and diversions for those of you in UK will be familiar with the language of roadmaps. Um, what's been really uh, interesting is the ever-changing complexities with COVID and every time we thought we got a grip and we were in the clear, something else would come along and just blow that out of the water and off we were, you know, into a different direction. So it really has been an ever-changing picture uh, throughout a very long period of time. And those are quite severe effects and impacts, but of course, these all present some fairly unique opportunities for change. You know, you think about the clamour of people in the first few months say, look, we should, we, we must never go back to how things were before. So some great opportunities here, both for the profession and also for countries and societies to move on from our experiences. Some of those opportunities I'd like to just discuss with you very briefly here. Um, you know, Duncan will speak on the next presentation about an idea of co-production and evolving, empowering, if you like, local people who've been very much at the forefront of responding to COVID in some of our future preparedness strategies around resilience. But there's also a great opportunity here to heal and review and learn, recognize, remember, you know, a collective uh, memorial of this particular event. You know, our, our relationship with mortality and death has been disrupted. The rituals that enable us to overcome major trauma all have been interrupted by COVID and the health measures required to actually manage the event but we also have realized that there are a number of essential services out there in society that have been critical to allowing life to continue to the very basic level that we should be able to celebrate and of course the effort of people like yourselves to help to respond to it so you know working on how we will collectively remember this particular event is something that we will continue to be very interested in at Manchester and we hope to uh, have a, a webinar very shortly specifically looking at which we'd be delighted if you uh, wanted to view and, and be a part of. <clears throat> There's also been huge opportunities here for integrating in a way certainly in the UK uh, and I, uh, certainly from our, our glimpses globally elsewhere as well integration of some of the agendas that haven't previously been brought together and have been intended to be managed in, in silos. So bringing communities with the health agenda, the businesses, resilience, and the sustainable development goals all together here on the back of a kind of more ambitious, aspirational, transformational 
uh, recovery to COVID is a, a huge opportunity that ought to be exploited. And again, addressing those inequalities that we mentioned earlier on through a slightly more diverse management of recovery and renewal is a fantastic opportunity for our engaging with our communities. And again, similar to vulnerability, risk and resilience is now better understood uh, by partners across the piece, but resilience and non-resilient partners and communities in a way, again, that we've never experienced before. But what a fantastic opportunity to exploit communities' understanding of risk and to change the narrative, which again is something both Duncan and I will come back to both later on today and then in further webinars into the future. Um, you know, we, we uh, would like to acknowledge that there is a new local resilience capability, but rather than steal his thunder, I'll, I'll allow Duncan to speak about that. That's very much a subject of his presentation. But also to build new foundations with resilience partners, to look again at skills, the agility, the flexibility, and here in the UK, the recently published integrated review, which for the first time is beginning to talk about engaging citizens in preparedness, resilience and response in a way that government has not done so previously. What are the implications for the profession itself? And again, to repeat, incredibly interested in your views on this stuff and I'd really like you to share in the chat function or in the Q&A session, some of your own views about what the implications or the challenges that are facing the profession into the future. These, these uh, boxes here are very much based on our observations of the UK. So they're unique to the UK but may or may not have a resonance with you beyond our shores. So, you know, recovery we found is all about consequence management. We've talked about the direct and the indirect consequences and the impacts they can have, but they are far reaching and long lasting. And, um, you know, go back to the beginning to repeat, you know, everybody was clear that they absolutely did not want to go back to pre-COVID days. What we've seen a year on, of course, is purely as a result of fatigue and quite understandable, is people now just want to move on beyond it. Recovery has to be about addressing those far reaching and long lasting impacts because they're not going to go away. So a real challenge for the profession to make sure that we keep this all on the agenda. And again, as part of that, to, to maintain and if not enhance and improve some of those relationships that we've developed over the last 14 months is again something I think the profession should be right at the middle and the forefront of. But also understanding that some of the responses internationally and nationally have been very corporate. So, for example, local government, other agencies here have stopped doing the normal day job and have put all of their attention and effort into responding and recovering to uh, COVID in a way that they've never been involved in previous disasters. What that's brought to the table, of course, is a whole range of skills and viewpoints beyond the traditional emergency planners, emergency planning uh, approach that has been fascinating and again is something that we ought to think about uh, exploiting. So here in the UK, for example, a lot of support from the military on logistics planning, um, you know, a development of a slightly more sophisticated approach to impact assessment, impact needs assessments. And again, how we've managed and learned to integrate community responses because communities have been absolutely at the front of all of this, has brought along with it some new opportunities to develop and enhance existing and indeed introduce you know, new skills to the profession itself. We very much think there is a, a fairly urgent need to look again at how we audit and assure risk reduction and resilience beyond the traditional debrief process. It, it has an absolute valuable role in understanding the voice from those people who've been practitioners and involved in it, but we don't think it goes deep enough to look at assuring exactly what we do as resilience partnerships beyond the pure response to a, uh, you know, to a particular event. And connected to that, we've, we've seen both here in the UK and elsewhere, frankly, variations in the maturity of people's arrangements, processes, structures and partnerships for dealing with disaster response and resilience. And it's not just at the local level, we've seen it at government levels, we've seen it in intergovernment department levels, and indeed within local resilience forums here in the EP. So it's not unique to one part of this response, you know, it wasn't just about the government's uh, actions, we've seen variations across the piece. And then we think that an audit and assurance process that's slightly more robust and rigorous will help level the playing field to make sure that actually citizens experience the same kind of response structures, uh, certainly from a resilience point of view, no matter what the area they live in and what the disaster is. 
there is a fantastic opportunity for changing the narrative we have about risk with the public, undoubtedly. Um, you know, their appetite for understanding risk, their appreciation that risk is real, I, I think gives us another, another great opportunity to just change the way we speak about vulnerability, risk and their preparedness. Um, the other thing we, we've remarked on for the profession is the agility, the flexibility um, it, over the last 14 months that the profession has shown has been tremendous. You know, I mean, you, you, you've had to go through such a, a, a seismic series of events that have made you change the way in which you would traditionally work. And we're very interested in looking again at the kind of role of some of our centres of excellence during a fast moving uh, global experience and just how effective they can be at uh, both understanding and learning lessons and then very quickly uh, you know, shaping skills, agility, and, and the future of the resilience as a profession. Um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of leave on this box uh, the implications for the profession of emergency management. You know, yep, some fantastically seismic events in the last 14 months. What we hope to do in this remaining uh, webinar, and indeed the two that will follow on from it in the autumn, is come back and have more conversations with you about how the profession can exploit the learning. And what I want to do to, to really tee up Duncan's presentation is just give you one example of where we think there's been a key shift in the last 10 years that could have uh, implications for the role of emergency management and the kind of skill sets that we will need as a profession. So looking from the left to the right, we're describing literally a journey we've taken in the last 10 years where, you know, 10 years ago, the message we would have had as responders was very much, look, we're here to save you. Um, you know, we didn't welcome community responses. We didn't understand how to integrate it or how to use it. We were slightly, uh, you know, mistrustful or, or less welcoming of some volunteers because we feared the risk factors and the vulnerability of having people we didn't know before coming to an event. In reality, they were going to come anyway. Um, and some of the events, certainly post-austerity here in the UK and elsewhere, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of restrictions and the limits on the amount of resources we have. Some events were simply going to be far too big to say that we were always, as responders, going to be the only people who could come and help. So we started to shift that mindset and that narrative to a conversation around, well, look, we're as prepared as we can be as responders. Are you, community, prepared for the risks that you would uh, face? And I think that's been a fascinating conversation with people who live where there is a real risk of a, a, a disaster that they can see, they can understand, and then helping them to make sure that they are prepared, both as individuals, families, businesses, you know, making sure the processes are there to make sure we could support people to move to safety quickly, for example, in the event of a disaster. But it did raise some additional doubts about just exactly how aware communities were of risk. And there's that horrible, uh, you know, that dichotomy, that tension around not wanting to scare people, but being realistic about what they should realist, you know, reasonably prepare them uh, themselves for, and indeed understanding a little bit more about how they would react. Well, you know, moving on the full 10 year journey, well, we now know because COVID has told us and has answered some of those doubts that communities are absolutely always going to be at the front of the response and probably will be there for the whole of the length of response and recovery. And they are there as a useful asset for us to integrate into the official response and recovery. You know, some of the numbers of volunteers are just unimaginable or were unimaginable before COVID came along. You know, we always thought about uh, volunteers, spontaneous volunteers in, in the sense of hundreds, if thousands. Now we're talking about hundreds of thousands. And these are people who bring with them local knowledge, local intelligence, the ability to add to our surveillance structures around health and well-being. And more importantly, they can actually be trusted to uh, you know, deliver some of the less risky parts of the response and recovery in support of their own uh, communities, of course, who, and they, of course, understand, uh, you know, and, and appreciate that community far more than many of us will do as responders. So um, thank you for that, Kyle. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to set up the next presentation from Duncan, who will take that narrative one more step further. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. 
Well, thank you very much. That's that's very interesting. Um, and we're starting to get a lot of comments now about that. I, I put one of your questions into the chat. So I'm going to capture some of those and I think we can move on to the to the next presenter and continue with that discussion, unless you want to take a question now or save them from later. We've got quite a few here. Uh, maybe maybe it, it might be wise to pick out some at the end, Carl, depending on time we have left. Okay, let's do that. Thank let's, you. Let's, we'll roll those up to the end and then we'll we'll um, move on from here. So, okay, over to um, the next presenter and we'll continue on with the presentation. Thank you. Can I check you can see my screen okay, Carl? Mm -hmm. Sure can. Great. So um, thank you, um, the audience, for coming along today and for this opportunity to chat to you too. Uh, David's really um, set up well what it is that I'm going to talk about, which is about looking again and rethinking, renewing how we do community resilience. So most people like this idea of community resilience. You know, it's an excellent opportunity to engage our communities to support each other. We've seen this during COVID. We've seen a tremendous outpouring of effort and enthusiasm from our communities. And as David said, they are they have been at the, the base of everything that's been done, at least in the UK, in terms of supporting people who've been shielding, supporting the vaccine programme, and, uh, and really supporting officials as they go about doing their job, because they're bringing such a capacity that um, was uh, not present uh, previous to that. Uh, we've also been looking and thinking about how um, communities can be part of directing their own future and community resilience is obviously a key component of that but one of the um, perhaps challenges is that community resilience often gets boiled down to volunteering. And so it's about thinking about how volunteers can be involved, about where the voluntary sector is, how the voluntary sector can really play a very key role in the response. And by community resilience, we're actually talking slightly different about looking at communities as individuals, communities as organizations, and so the very important role that businesses and organizations have in resilience, looking at community groups, so there might be faith groups or local civic groups that uh, exist in an area, or looking at the associations and the networks that are built across all three of those different groups. And one of the challenges, I think, with community resilience is that it's quite a hard concept to pin down. When it's difficult to know what it is. It's difficult to know how can you actually build it? How do you mobilize it? So which is the button that you press when you need to activate community resilience? And actually, we think that these questions are probably the wrong questions to even ask. That What we need to start thinking about is how do we operationalize community resilience? So how do we build it into an infrastructure and a way in which that infrastructure can be mobilized so that when something hits when something um, requires um, a, a community response, then you have the capabilities there to be able to respond. So we're putting a much more focus now and thinking about how do we actually operationalize a local resilience capability? So the focus here is on those capabilities, the capabilities that local communities can have in terms of building their own resilience. We think that, um, and, and over the next few slides, I'm just going to talk about some steps. These are not really steps so much, um, but uh, things that we need to start thinking about in terms of this local resilience capability. Um, it's facilitated by local resilience partners. So this might be local government, it might be um, key groups that um, have agency, have the ability to lead, um, but these are facilitative um, organizations. Um, in fact, the, the local resilient capability is designed, it's driven, it's owned by the local community groups. It's owned by the organizations that exist at that level. Um, it will involve youth and university students in ways that certainly we don't um, in the UK at the moment, we don't have that very strong focus like they do in some countries. In Chile, for example, we're in who is specifically focused on how do you activate youth and how do you involve youth in emergency response. The voluntary sector obviously have a very important role to play in local resilience capability. They, they can represent and they can act as a, a really important voice within communities and on behalf of communities. And obviously we've got in households and individuals. The key 
thing across all of these groups is that it's not everybody. It's not every household. It's not every organization. It's not every um, community or, or, or local group. It's about coverage. It's about making sure that we have um, coverage, we have capacity across our communities rather than everybody is involved in this, which is an unrealistic expectation. So it might be that some communities um, are perhaps slower to engage, but there are other communities around them who are able to support that and, and encourage and, um, and offer some learning that can help communities to develop these sort of capabilities. But these capabilities are obviously, as I said, facilitated by the local resilience partners. In terms of the aim, very often the aim of uh, community resilience is to enable resilient behaviours, is to enable community-led action. We think that the aims for local resilience, for the capabilities are slightly different. It's to reduce the likelihood of an impact. It's to reduce the severity of that impact and to reduce the need to recover. And so the focus now is put very much on likelihood, severity and recovery. So if we move into preparedness, we can see that um, to reduce um, the severity or to reduce likelihood, it might be about identifying risks at source, identifying and pinpointing where the vulnerabilities are in a community and dealing with those vulnerabilities, about identifying impacts and what those impacts have been so that they can co-produce with local government, with resilient partners. They can co-produce ambitions, they can strategies in order to address those and engage in prevention and protection activities. So it's very much about communities, um, as David mentioned, being that sort of intelligence spoke that goes into that goes in and identifies the information that's needed and then identifies what they're going to do about the challenges that they've uh, found. In terms of building this local resilience capability, many parts of the infrastructure are already there because you know, local communities are doing community resilience, local government is doing community resilience. We think that the capabilities can centre around informing strategy. And as I said previously, it's about that co-production, the co-production of strategy for response, recovery, renewal, resilience. So involving communities in their own future. It's about having communities provide intelligence. So this requires two-way communication channels with communities. So the intelligence about risk, vulnerability, preparedness can be um, communicated across communities as well as up to local government so that communities can be supported as they begin to develop and, and, and uh, um, respond to, to some of these challenges. It's about communities managing their own preparedness activities, managing how response can happen along with professional responders. So this does not negate in any way the need for first responders to be there, um, but it's about supporting, and as David mentioned, about saying, how can we help each other by developing governance, by developing plans, by ensuring assets are ready, by having training so that communities are able to respond to this. Communities we've seen during COVID can coordinate supply and demand. They can identify what the demands are. They can identify how to address those demands through supply. And we've seen this, um, they were the first responders during COVID, as David said. And um, we've seen this ability of communities to coordinate and to communicate um, across partners to enable that to happen uh, more effectively. And that part of delivering activities, deploying these capabilities by having um, these units who are able to deploy, who are able to have autonomous change happen. Um, communities have been doing this across the UK. And what we can see if we start to think about these capabilities, we can start to look at whether strategy and leadership is actually present and whether or not it's effective. We can look at how the intelligence around risks, vulnerabilities and preparedness, just going around this chart here, how effective are they? We can look at governance plans, asset readiness and education and see to what extent are our communities able to respond um, in, in support of local government, in support of um, first responders. And we can begin to evaluate the system that's there to understand whether it is truly ready or whether it still needs an awful lot more support and where that support needs to be pinpointed. In terms of what these capabilities are, we think that the capabilities form around three rough categories. The first category is around contributing, around volunteers um, coming from businesses, from the voluntary sector, but coming with skills 
but then there'll be volunteers that come without skills who are spontaneous volunteers and there we need policies and processes to be able to support those individuals who want to respond the pop-up groups that are there um, the donations management is an important part um, of what communities can contribute and so there, there can be that, um, that policy and processes as to how we're going to deal with donations um, so that we can um, deal with that at a local level. There's um, some coordination activities, as I mentioned, around the, the local resilience capabilities, and this is about organised communities, trained teams coming in, the voluntary sector offer, um, networking these resources so that um, the communities can be coordinated and can be organised. Um, we think that there's um, some work to do around information dissemination. There's an awful lot of work already been done around alerting and warning and informing during an emergency, but then there is activity that can happen before an emergency. So having debates with communities about risk, about vulnerabilities, about preparedness. And that's obviously one of the key tasks of a local resilience capability, is having those conversations. Uh, local community infrastructure is really important as well, um, making sure that when disruptions happen, then at-risk communities are still able to receive services. And then the aftermath. So here it's about local resilience being involved in recovery. So both in terms of impact needs assessment, recovery plans, renewal summits, getting them involved, getting their interests heard and feeling as though they have ownership of what happens in their place. It's around business continuity, making sure that those organisations that are there are able to continue to function, that they have relationships with local communities and those relationships are able to support resilience building activities. And then going right down to the household level and being uh, making people aware, sharing education, sharing resources. But again, recognising that not every household, not every group, not every business will want to participate in this, but it's about coverage rather than about saturation. And again, we can start looking to see, well, how well are we doing on each of these different capabilities? Where can we take effort away? Where can we, do we need to put renewed effort onto in order to create some of these capabilities? And I didn't say, but I should have said, is that these are just some of the capabilities that we've identified. And I'm sure that during the conversation this afternoon, we can start to identify more opportunities for developing some capabilities. So uh, I'd just like to um, end there. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'll hand back to Kyle. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Duncan. That was really interesting. I actually have some questions for you, but I'll, <laughs> I'll save that for later on. <laughs> Cheers um, productive later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, good. Yeah, so we've got a lot of questions, but I wanna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Harold. So Harold, over to you for the next presentation. Thank you, Kyle. I will start. Hello, everybody, wherever you are. I am president of the International Emergency Management Society. I see there is a lot of new people that might not know us, but we are an international NGO founded in 1993, and we are based in Brussels with a small headquarter, and we have 17 chapters around the world. We are uh, engaged in, uh, we are a voluntary organization engaged in conferences. We do these webinars and we do research, participate in EU research programs. And we have an education program with certification in emergency management. And I will now address you a little bit uh, on an international scale with some thoughts of uh, how we can put the learning of this COVID-19 into the future planning. I will start sharing my screen. <clears throat> okay, you, let's see. Yeah, I have... Um, here said, um, I will do some observation and thoughts based for discussion. I've called it lessons learned for improved future pan pandemic resilience. But I found when I was preparing this, I found uh, a book called Disaster by Choice 
I thought that was a good expression. And in this book, I haven't read the book, but in the uh, telling about the book, uh, he presents a disaster is a process manufactured and implemented by people and their choices. And that gives me to come with a statement and say, the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic was a process manufactured and implemented by people and their choices. Uh, I will go through something and then we can see if that could be a true statement. But I will start with saying we were warned about this because in September 2019, Gro Harlem Brundtland, a former prime minister of Norway, and Eliad Assi, a secretary general of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, they published a study just three, four months before the pandemic, namely say, saying preventing the next pandemic. And, uh, uh, and uh, they say that uh, this has been neglected, an approach that is putting all of us at growing risk. Governments worldwide must start thinking ahead and increase funding at the community, national and international levels to shore up health system and prevent the spread of outbreaks. And then they say, imagine the following scenario. In a matter of days, a lethal influenza pandemic spreads around the world halting trade and travel, triggering social chaos, gutting the global economy and endangering tens of millions of lives. Such a large scale disease outbreak is an alarming but entirely realistic prospect. To mitigate the risk, the world must take steps now to prepare. As we know it, governments were warned through this and other risk studies but it seems like this warning was mostly neglected or ignored by those in charge of taking actions. So we didn't really believe this could happen. And I just took down the numbers of yesterday and they are even worse than what was predicted in this risk analysis. Because as we say, the number of deaths by now is 3.2 million. Uh, yesterday, this was data of uh, yesterday, 14,000 and the total infected 155 million, much more than predicted in this study and eight, uh, 833,000 yesterday. And the trend is 36 countries with increasing trend already. And as we see of the curves, we are into the third um, uh, third wave. Some countries are not reached the third wave and we might have more waves in the future. And I made some observation on the pandemic spread and the resilience, what has caused the different things we see in the different countries in the world. And I think one thing we have seen is leadership acknowledgement of facts and science. This has not been the case in some of our big nations and have led to quite dramatic numbers of infected and deaths. Strategy, we also see that there are different strategies that have been used, stop the spread by measures or flock or herd immunity. It seems like the flock or herd immunity has not been the right strategy because we see differences by those using the different way of the strategy. And vaccine access. Not all has the same access to vaccines. I will come back to that. And economic and social measures. Close down of economic and social activity. And we know that has happened all over the world. And we have now, I live in Norway, and we have now opened again this, there have been the shops which have been actually closed for three months in Norway. They opened yesterday. So we see, will there be a fourth wave in Norway or have we reached a level of vaccination that 
gives us uh, uh, protection. But I have looked here at what has happened. January 9th, the WHO announces mysterious coronavirus related to pneumonia in Wuhan, in China. And the January 21, Chinese scientists confirms COVID-19 made human transmission. January 23rd, Wuhan now under quarantine. January 31, WHO issues global health emergency. February 2nd, global air travel is restricted, is starting to see consequences. February 10th, China COVID-9 deaths exceeds those of the SARS crisis. March 11, then this is uh, three, well, it's about two months since the first detection in China. WHO declares COVID-19 a pandemic. March 25, Reports find extended shutdowns can delay second wave. We know the second wave came and we are even in the third wave. And in December, we then start discovering new mutants and they, we now have the UK mutant, we have South Africa, the Indian, and they are coming up uh, all the time. And 21 has all been about vaccines efficiency, side effects, and worldwide distribution, and also to discover the truth about the virus origin. I see they're still discussing uh, how did this uh, start up. And I have um, said uh, my conclusion on this is that transparency and openness about the virus outbreak and consensus about measures to implement in order to reduce the outbreak could have slowed down and the spread of the virus. Uh, this is a map showing we have now started the vaccination phase, which started around beginning of January. And as you see, it's not evenly distributed over the world. We see USA is doing very well, some other countries are, but you have a almost a white continent in Africa and also Australia is lacking behind. Uh, and I have looked into several of the observation of vaccination. And several vaccines have been developed during one year or less in 2020. And one year is a very, very short development and testing time for a new vaccine. And we also have, because of this, seen serious, even fatal side effects have been discovered with a couple of them. In Norway, I think we have had five deaths because of one of the vaccines. A few countries have, a, have had a precautionary approach to use vaccines with fatal side effects. So in Norway and Denmark, the two of the vaccines are put on hold. Access to vaccines is not evenly distributed worldwide. And, but the news we had lately was that removal of patent rights or free licenses for vaccines for a short or long time in development countries seem to happen for their own vaccine production. And this can help the spread of the vaccine around the world. There, another thing, observation, there exists vaccination hesitancy in many countries and uh, very much because of several conspiration theories are influencing people's belief in the vaccines. And what is now being discussed also in Norway, vaccination passports are being prepared in many countries in order for opening up to societies and allow international traveling again. I've summed up this as saying the following, Vaccination solid solidarity worldwide should be a must because without stopping the virus spread worldwide, it may pop up again in a fourth and a fifth wave anywhere. And an honest and precautionary vaccination approach increase people's belief in, belief in the vaccine. 
and an active authoritative public approach with fact towards conspiration theories can increase trust in the authorities and their approach with fighting the pandemic. I have uh, summed up this in some brief uh, summing up here, saying <clears throat> the COVID-19 pandemic spread out worldwide with de devastating consequences due to the people and their choices, because all have been choices all along. I think we can say that. There will be new epidemics and pandemics, and the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic should be used in developing strategies and action plans for being prepared for fighting future pandemics. And we need coordinating this and work together on it. And I do believe that WHO should be strengthened and play an even stronger role in preparing for future pandemics. And same with national and local CDCs in cooperation with civil protection agencies. There must be much more cooperation, much more models, sharing ideas in order to be ready for what will happen next. And uh, teams, we participated in a project called ASSET, was about pandemic. This was back in 2009 to uh, 2013. And we had, an, um, we did a um, survey in eight cities in Europe at the same time, ask them questions about uh, pandemic and their belief, if they what they wanted to know. And one major finding was the public wanted through to what everybody it is. And a participatory governance that the public can be asked and be part of the process is also something they wanted. So transparency, openness, and honesty, I think build trust to the authorities and weaken conspiration theories. And vaccination solidarity worldwide should be self-evident with patent-free local production for building more resilient society against pandemics. And I think also that COVID-19 passports may be necessary. They might be looked upon very unsolidary because those who are not vaccinated might not have the same um, same opportunities, but I think it's necessary for stimulating economic growth and international travel. We must not forget that there are other disaster types which also have to be prepared for, prepared for as well. COVID-19 has taken most of the time of all for all of us for a year, but we must not forget there are the disaster types. Thank you. That was all. I will stop sharing. All right. Thank you very much, Harold. Much appreciated. And so now we've got a few minutes left to go through a couple of questions. And actually, I just wanted to let me just share my screen so you can see that's a question session. <laughs> so I actually have broken down a lot of the questions that you've asked into just a couple of categories. And I want to come back to David first, and which is um, to talk about just very briefly, one second. Um, I wanted to break these down into different sort of categories. So David, first, let's talk about governance access, long-term recovery and sort of information and disinformation campaigns that are out there. So it, uh, that's a big kind of thing to, to, to bring together, but I'll try and summarize <laughs> it to a single, single question, <laughs> right? And so in terms, of, uh, in terms of like psychosocial support, economic yep. capacity in communities, accessibility, these kind of thematic issues, can you kind of expand upon what you've seen with regards to government response to these characteristics? Yeah, and, I, and also in terms of long-term government response and sustainability. So obviously the response to the pandemic addressing these characteristics, but then how does the government go in with long-term efforts in those regards? That sounds like another webinar to me, uh, Kyle. Does, I think we could, does, fill, we could fill a day. Uh, look, I'll try to be really brief. Um, so uh, we, we would see um, that the quality and sophistication of impact needs assessments and the process used for learning the broadest strategic lessons are critical to answering that question. 
So, for example, I, I think in the chat room, the, the question was around how do you recover economy, social and psychological mm -hmm. impacts? Well, economy, you know, fiscal management is a, a national government issue. I, it's not for me to comment on that, but I could certainly comment on some of the opportunities here on the back of COVID experiences in particular to bring some of those broader agendas together, including adaptation, climate change, economic development, et cetera, and, and give ge geographies you know, government in local ge geographic areas, the ability to jointly look at investment in future funding, or indeed even bidding for grant funds to support some of their local world. And again, I think this is one of the things that COVID has brought to the table here in making health partners talk to local government partners in a way they never used to do. And now they're looking for opportunities to do things differently. And again, the whole efficiency about better ways of working I think is the only way we're going to recover the economy. But fiscal management of that, Carl, is beyond my pay grade, I think, in fairness. I think that's something for, you know, national global finance and government. But social needs is certainly something we're very interested in. So these emerging needs, the hidden needs that have been uh, slow to come to the fore in uh, COVID and some of the indirect consequences, some of which I notice have been talked about in the chat room, which is fascinating to hear about. Again, we believe it's all about building community capacity, agency, co-production, um, you know, looking at the cohesion and the community resilience is the only way to deal with societal uh, issues that arise from COVID. But also that, that often forgotten, really critical part of the play here, the essential local services that just kept us going. You know, who knew that we'd go to a supermarket and want to applaud the, you know, the individuals who've just been working for 14 months, sometimes without very little PPE, by the way. But, you know, people who've proved to be far more essential than we ever gave them credit for prior to this, I think is one of the ways that we look at societal recovery. The, the psychological stuff, some of the language is, is concerning, but people here, professionals here have been talking about there being a predicted tsunami of need for psychological support because, all the normal support and surveillance systems that we would have had in place, have, of course, have been severely curtailed because of the health challenges of visiting home. So think about some of the public protection issues, child abuse, domestic violence, you know, all of that. So even dealing with backlogs of normal psychological support all now need to be addressed by, again, looking at integrating health, social care systems and indeed engaging communities in the, the, the voluntary sector a lot more closely I'm, I'm conscious carl that's a real gallop through and it, it deserves a much more comprehensive answer but within my my limited knowledge i think they're the key things that jump out for me no great that, i think that's a great start and it absolutely is a, a discussion that we should be having and we will uh in our future webinars that are coming up but duncan i'm gonna turn to you with another robust question uh and and kind of talk a little bit because you actually displayed some models where you had assess some data and some metrics. And so there were some questions in the chat about the quantitative and qualitative analysis behind some of your, the data that you're showing. And then also I'm sort of also looking at that in terms of uh, long-term sustainability and change in communities. And so that's something that you've also hinted on as well in, in your presentation. Maybe you could expand on some of your thoughts and some of the information that you found because gathering, you know, I would just say very quickly that you know, we're calling that intelligence, but sometimes that's off-putting to some people. Uh, and then, so what is the data that's driving these kind of dynamics and, and especially in terms of long-term sustainability, because it, at least for my career in the emergency mm -hmm. services, it's after a disaster, you've got two weeks to try and change anything and then people forget about it. But this is obviously a quite a different scenario, but it's still, it's still something that has to be addressed. So over to you, Duncan. Thank you. So, yeah, I saw the, the same question in the chat. Um, so how have we been developing these models? Well, we've been participating in countless hours of uh, response meetings. So both across the UK and um, internationally, we've been sitting, listening to the strategic, the tactical uh, coordination meetings as they deal with the issues that COVID is presenting. Some of those are very specialized down to humanitarian aid and how they distribute food, and some are very general. So we've been listening to that, those conversations happening. Um, we've been participating in recovery group meetings. So we've been taking a much more active role in terms of trying to help local government to think about how can they recover and what is the process for recovery. So thinking about impact 
impact assessments and what have been the impacts, thinking about what do you do about those impacts, how do you develop plans, strategies around them, and then how do you develop what we're calling a renewal strategy. And these renewal strategies look at the long term, look at the what do we want not to go back to after COVID, what we learned from COVID that we really need to take some transformational change around and helping government to think through what is the process that we need to go through to, um, to address some of these challenges. And again, doing that in the UK and overseas. Then we've been um, bringing um, together a series of interviews across the world, as David mentioned, talking to 60, 70 people um, and trying to understand what their intentions for recovery are. We've done that in the first wave during last summer. We're doing another wave of that now. And our intention is to do four waves of that to understand how those intentions have changed across the period of COVID. We're bringing all of that together in trying to understand some of these challenges, the challenges that David's been talking about and that I've been talking about around local resilience. So those radar charts that I put up were mocks. They were not the real um, assessment of any local authority or any country. Um, we believe that those should be self-assessment tools so that um, local government communities can look and can start to look within themselves to say, how confident do we feel given the context that we face, given the plans, the preparedness that we have in place, given all of that, how confident do we feel and where do we need to put additional effort or indeed where can we feel confident enough to take effort away from? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that quick gallop through in Davis language has, has covered the methodology as well as the long term, but uh, we see renewal summits as being absolutely key to this long term and, and putting some really quite special focus politically as well as an executive level within local government on what do we want to change about the way in which we live our lives in our place. Yeah, no, that's hugely interesting. So a renewal summit, see how we're going to build back the communities after all of this. I mean, it, I, I still think, and I think you've actually said this uh, in, in one of your presentations earlier, that we still haven't seen all the quite the long-term effects of what's happening. Uh, and so we still don't know what we're yet dealing with. If it was mentioned about domestic violence, and I know we've done some case studies in one of the countries I'm working in, and it's seen just marked increases of domestic violence cases because of the fact of quarantine measures. And those are just unforeseen effects that we just had no idea would really happen, or at least you know that wasn't a planning assumption when we were making these things. So that, that's quite interesting itself. Absolutely. And there are other effects that we can't, as David Rory can't even imagine at the moment. We need to go out and understand um, what the effects on communities have been by asking the communities rather than mm. um, trying to foresee what those um, effects might be. Yeah. And along with that, I mean, some of the things that we had seen, I think it was mentioned in the chat about even just basic Internet access, you know, so homeschooling for all the kids and then not having Internet access or equipment or the economic issues behind that is something, again, that typically in emergency management in the past that we not were not really considering as being a planning factor because it was just really unforeseen. But I think and, and that's where um, we can we can go ahead and transition a bit and talk about the next webinars that are coming up, because this is really the future of emergency management. These are the things that we have to start looking at and discussing because the work that you're doing at University of Manchester, I think, is critical to this aim of where we have to start really finding a way ahead to get ourselves out of this pandemic as we start having more vaccinations, as we start recovering and getting back to a um, quote unquote, maybe normal version of society uh, and dealing with the effects of what we've all been through as a global community. Uh, in that case, uh, we do have two additional webinars that are coming up this year as part of this special series with CBI teams and the University of Manchester. And that's going to be I think it's we've got those scheduled in September and October as a continuation of this discussion. Uh, and we're actually going to go a little bit further, a little bit deeper into some of these topics and uh, even have some possibly even some additional speakers on board as well. And so that we can get a little bit deeper into those things. Now, to find out more information about that, then you are registered with the University of Manchester system because you are now here, but also just in case. If you are not, well, you are there, but also as well, you can join the LinkedIn group where we have about 200 emergency management uh, personnel from the community. Now in that LinkedIn group, you can find out some more information there. It's under Capacity Building International, but that's from our webinar series on international models and emergency management. And then of course, um, stay connected to the University of Manchester website and their information that they're publishing as well, subscribing to the newsletter. And in future webinars, we're gonna be doing are looking at different national models, but of course we are, keenly interested in this future discussion and what's happening in emergency management. 
So at that point, unless there's any other comments, uh, David or Duncan or Harold, um, uh, I think we've covered about all of it and we hit about over an hour already. That was quick. No, thanks, Carl. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you, Carl. All right, Harold, any last comments from your side? No, I think this was great. Thank you all. Have great weekends. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for attending. And uh, we will see you in the next webinar session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.